Okay. Thank you. You're all welcome to our webinar tonight. I'm very confident you are going to find this very insightful. If this is your first time joining our webinar, you are highly welcome. We are iScholar Initiative. And uh, what do we do? iScholar Initiative seeks to mentor and empower young African students in fulfilling their dreams to pursue graduate studies via access to fully funded scholarship in world-class foreign universities by leveraging the networks of partnering members. Yes, we have amazing partners with Golden Hearts, you know, that funds this sponsorship. So you can follow us on our different platforms to keep you updated with our activities, application process and requirements, and how you can benefit from it. We're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. And uh, our team tonight is navigating your first year in graduate studies. We are here tonight to prepare you in advance and we have our powerful panelists that are going to share their valuable experiences and I'm confident you'll find them very insightful. So have all your questions ready because they're going to be answered from experience, not. Yeah, and uh, our moderate tonight is uh, Fahidat. She's going to start by introducing our panelists. So once again, you're all welcome. And over to you, Ms. Fahidat. Oh, thank you, Ma. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Fahidat Badamosi. I'm a 2019 I scholar. And I'm very, very excited to moderate this session and to have you all join us to learn about first year in grad school. You know, it's one thing to actually get the admission, then it's another to actually do very well in school, not just academically, but to build your network, to, to put yourself in position to transition into a good job when you're done and all of that. So our panelists tonight, like you can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, right? yes. So our panelists tonight, we have Ortega, um, my apologies if I do not pronounce the names very well. the last name. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> we have Otega, we have Olajide, and we have Samo. Um, I can see Otega, I can see Samo. Olajide, please, are you on the call? Yes, I'm with you guys. Okay, great, great. Thank you very much for joining. So um, to start off, we would want our panelists to actually give us an overall run through of their grad school experience just in three minutes each. So um, should we say ladies first? Otega, can you? Uh, okay, sure. I I'll try to, I'd like to share my screen now. Yes, you can, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, all right. Do you see the screen? Not yet. Not yet. Hmm. Not at all. Okay. All right. How about now? Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, just, sorry, sorry to interrupt you just mm -hmm. before you start. You have three minutes each to actually run through this for us. Okay. Just because it's three minutes, I, uh, kind of put my thoughts on the one uh, PowerPoint slide and uh, basically to help me navigate through in three minutes. Okay, so three minutes starts now. Now, yeah. basically as a first year student, you have four major things to deal with, like uh, classes, teaching, research, and they have this caution max because those are the most important things. And then you also have the extracurricular activities which you can network and build um, friendships around. Now, personally, I kind of put that on hold towards the last point of my first year, basically because I needed to find my footing in academics first. Everyone's different. You can decide to mix everything together. You can decide to just postpone some for the last time. Now I divided into four sessions, caution, hard work, patience, and sanctuary, basically because that's what helped me through my first year and even to the last point of my um, PhD studies. Now, caution starts with the first time you get here. The cultural shock. There will be cultural shock, by the way. It doesn't matter how many American movies you've watched or European movies you've watched. You will have a cultural shock because you have um, different people coming from different continents. So how do you deal with that? I like to call it my strategy. I observed 
and then I learned and then I implemented what and then basically because some people consider some things insulting others not insulting so you want to observe these things you want to ask questions when you're in doubt because if you don't know and you don't ask you can never really know so moving from orientation and foreign schools are really good on um, giving you orientations on how to navigate the waters when you first come. So you want to really listen and learn. And so that was my strategy. And then for hard work, it's usually very overwhelming in the first years. So you want to be able to communicate with people around you. So no man is in isolation, don't isolate yourself. Communicate, observe and be fearless about your learning. There will be gaps. If you're coming from Nigeria, especially in the sciences or from Africa in general, there will be gaps. So you want to be fearless about your approach and um, your research or your classes. Um, if there's nothing, it's something, you know, make use of the resources and also be, be persevere. Like there'll be things you won't get the first time or there will be things you won't even get the second or the third time. So just persevere in what you do. And then finally, patient, don't be hard on yourself. If you're smart enough to get into grad school, you're smart enough to finish. So don't be hard on yourself. Explore. Um, if you fall, especially in research, the sciences, you know how that feels to have a field experiment. Just keep going because then you're combining so many things. You don't have the luxury to feel sorry for yourself. So you want to move on. And then um, when you get to... Um, where the part where you have to do your academics, your research, the most vital part of your first year is choosing an advisor, whether it's a master's or a PhD. It pretty much runs your life in the next couple of years. So you want to be very intentional in that. If you believe in God, pray. If you, if you seek advice from people higher up, please do, because that's what determines whether you find grad school interesting or a very hellish place to be in. And finally, you need a sanctuary. It doesn't have to be a church. It could be family, it could be friends, it could be colleagues, communities. You need a pillar of support. And I speak from experience because there will be oh, bad days. Bad. And then you need um, family and friends to make you laugh and tell you you're not stupid, you're good enough, and that's why you're there. So that's why you need um, a sanctuary. And that's why I labeled my last fact a sanctuary. Fahida, how am I doing this time? Okay, you're, oh. you're doing very well. So actually three minutes is up, but thank okay. you so much for covering all of that in three minutes. I mean, okay. and it's exciting to know that Otega completed a PhD in May and she transitioned to a job at Intel right after. Congratulations, Ortega. She also Thanks. won the uh, most prestigious graduate student award in our school. Very, very exciting. So um, can you stop sharing your screen? Oh, sure. Uh, okay. There we are. Okay, great. So um, Olajide, Olajide um, I'll share his bio now. It would be taking us through his grad school experience. You know, Ortega went to the US, Olajide was in Europe. So it'd be nice to hear from someone who schooled in Europe. So Olajide, please go on. Okay, um, thank you, um, Faida. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, great, thank you. Uh, um, basically, like you said, I'm like the old one out from the panelists today. Um, they were in North America. <laughs> I was in Europe, so, yeah, nice to have uh, a diverse view about um, graduate school in Europe. Okay. So thank you very much. Basically, I studied in um, two countries in Europe. Uh, I was in France. Uh, I had a two years master's degree, so I was in France for the first year, and I was in Germany for um, for the second year of my program. Um, um, graduate school was a mix of uh, I call it a mix of four things for me. It was a mix of uh, study. It was a mix of mix of work experience. It was a mix of, uh, it was, uh, there was another thing uh, which I call um, uh, travel. As you all know that Europe is really good for that. Sorry to those in North America, you can't really do that much. And, then, and as well as uh, uh, language. I see this because that was the uh, top, top soft skill I really picked up while in graduate school and I was intentional about it. And I believe that going forward, it would be uh, really crucial for me. So, Graduate school was um, quite nice. Uh, as you all know, Europe, my class was really multicultural. Um, everybody from every continent was represented. I mean, practically everybody so had a rich exchange of uh, cultural experience. Um, I got um, the top, top quality education I could uh, for free, obviously. 
And um, there's this notion about, uh, especially with Nigerians, we don't know much about uh, the French or German system, but I can tell you, these guys are really good, and I enjoyed some of the best time education and uh, experience in the whole world. So um, it was a mixture of that. It was, uh, um, like I said, multicultural, and I was able to travel, especially when the going gets tough. I was able to pick my bags and then quickly pick the, um, get away free and um, things like that. So it was also an opportunity to network uh, through uh, um, network with other people and gain internship experience and things like that. And that's where the people start coming. So uh, we call it we call it long leg in Nigeria, but uh, for us it's just networking. Who are those people you know? Who are those uh, who referred you? So these are part of the things that we are really helpful in um, graduate study in Europe. And they help me to gain um, uh, quality um, internship experiences as well. So basically, uh, my graduate study was, uh, of course, it was full of ups and downs, uh, as you know, obviously, uh, due to the shift coming from Nigeria. But uh, I just had to get out of, of the way and uh, get, the, get, get things going. But basically, what I'll be, as we proceed, I'll be bringing in references from. Um, my experience so far in Europe, so it may be a little bit different from uh, from uh, North America, but uh, hopefully uh, there will be people in the panel today who are starting off in Europe pretty soon or plan to, and they can gain uh, uh, one or two. Yeah. So basically, those four things were uh, uh, some sort of my experience. Uh, I got this study in Europe. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, it is even an advantage for us to have someone who went to Europe here. You know, like you talked about the language barrier. I really want to know how, how you managed with that. And it is also exciting to know that Olivier is currently an early career material engineer. So for those of us who want to transition to the industry, once we are done with our grad school, I mean, we're going to be learning the tips and insights from these amazing people, how to position ourselves right from the first year. So our third panelist is Samuel Adeleye. Samuel is, and I don't know how to qualify Samuel, but I'm sure a lot of us on this call most likely know Samuel and he has impacted us in one way or the other. So Samuel, um, Samo is still is still in grad school, so it's another advantage for us to hear from someone who is still in grad school. So Samo, so far, can you tell us what your experience has been? Can everyone hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I can oh, hear you. Okay. I believe everyone can hear you. Okay, awesome. Um, so transition into grad school for me was initially a shock considering where I was coming from, um, everyone used to believe I was very intelligent <laughs> until I got to grad school and we took our, let's say, a kind of exam we call the entrance exam immediately inside the program. And I found myself in position number 20, 21 out of 24 in the class. Um, that was really terrible. And that was the first time I, I kind of opened up my mind to understand how and what is really required in the environment which I find myself. So I'll break down my first year experience into the following, which after the first shock, I had to um, approach it like a scientist. So the first thing I did was to try to explore the resources that are available. I asked myself the question, what do I have? Um, Exploring these resources will give me an edge. I want to know what subscriptions do I have? What books do I have available? Um, how, is the, how can I get mentors that will guide me through my classes? How should I ask this question and the other? Just like the first speaker said, one thing you should try to do, um, which I also adopted, was to forget about the person everyone believe I was, and I started afresh. So that simply means you should be very intentional when you want to ask questions whenever you get confused. Because um, decisions in, uh, in a land where you have little or no experience is going to be a very tough one. And until you know the resources that are available, you might not be able to transition well. 
I took my classes quite seriously because, yes, um, I was told that if I don't pass my classes and take my qualifiers exam, I will not proceed to the second year, or perhaps even if I proceed to the second year, I will lose a year because I have to take the qualifiers exam again. So that was like a big shock to me. But when I um, used the resources comparing the um, educational standards in the United States, and what I had in Nigeria in my bachelor's and master's degree. Yes, I was able to fail through. I had an excellent GPA in my first year. And one thing I could say again is asking questions led me to know availability of funds that are also available in the institution. So I was able to also apply for another scholarship, which I got the second fellowship that is going to be running for the next two years. Um, down to how to choose a lab right now, I've chosen a thesis lab. Um, it's a very difficult decision, but I might explain that anytime later. And finally, I had this big conference, which I think the first speaker called the Sanctuary, which basically to me is just this small circle of international, as well as my church, where whenever I have a problem, I know the place to run. If it is academically, it is this support system of my friends come together. To discuss my research with me, tell me what they think I'm doing wrong, try to give me suggestions, we troubleshoot together. Well, whenever I think I'm emotionally down, I run to the church, I do my prayers. And so far, so good, I will say um, I'm on a good standing and my research is progressing well. I failed a lot and a lot in my research. And um, yeah, right now, I think I'm progressing well. Any moment from the spring semester, I will take my second year candidacy. And then I'll because uh, a PhD candidate. Oh, wow. And I, I believe I will have an exciting session to answer as many questions as available. Thank you. Oh, wow, well, wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. You know, something caught my attention because you are a scholar brain buster. That's, that's what we know you has. And for you to actually go through that of being the 21st out of 24 in the class, uh, oh my goodness, you know, when everyone was registering for this session, they had actually put out questions they would like to ask you. So I'm going to be running through all of these questions with you. And one of them, which I would want, pretty much want Samo to answer since he has experienced the 21st out of 24, <laughs> is um, someone, someone asked that, how do, should I be preparing before I resume to grad school, like between now and let's say next year, I already have my admission. I already know I'm going. What should I be doing to actually put me in a better position for excellence when I get to grad school? Awesome. Thank you very much for that awesome question. And I will say this is a question I wish I knew before I went to Rutgers. Um, so every, the first thing I will any student that is about to go to grad school, particularly the first year, is to go through the program structure. Try to familiarize yourself so well with the structure of the program. What I mean by the program structure is you know the exams you're supposed to take, you know the course material, you know the timing, because those things are things that um, they are, they are like cast iron. I don't know how the system is being designed here, but I can confidently tell you that when they tell you your exam is on by November, then just get ready that your exam is going to be November. In my case, I was taking exam every three weeks, which is that was why I called it a shock because um, it looks like um, let, me put, let me just cite one example. I would say everything I learned from my biochemistry between the first year of my university education in Nigeria, down to my final year, down to my master's degree was crashed into three weeks. So, and after that three weeks, I took an exam. Now what I mean is, I really wish I knew the recommended test books that I were already recommended for this course to give myself a better foundation to um, understand most of the lectures because I really had to learn it the hard way. So what I did basically was when I got to school, I got the recommended test book, so it became my Bible. Um, for the course, I was basically sleeping about four hours every day, not because I don't like sleep, 
but because I know if I sleep, I won't be able to catch up. And the truth is, before you know it, your time is up. So for someone who is really aspiring to go to uh, grad school maybe next year, interact with students who are already in the system. Ask them, hey, what are the course materials that you studied during your first year? They will definitely tell you, oh, this is the recommended textbook. They're going to tell you, oh, this is the software you're supposed to learn. They're also going to tell you, oh, I think you should have this knowledge or the other. So a, a good interaction with someone who is in that school that will expose you to the resources that you're supposed to learn will give you an edge. And if there is one more thing I would advise anybody, especially if you are a Nigerian coming down from Nigeria, start learning how to read research publications. It will shock you because most of the things that are discussed, even during the lectures, they are all publications. Okay. Okay. Right people. Samuel, sorry, okay. I, I would have to interrupt you. And I would have to um, say that we should try to keep our responses maybe within 30 seconds to one minute so we can cover as many questions as possible because I have more than 50 looking at me right now. <laughs> So, and I also want to inform the um, participants on the call, please, as we proceed, if you have any questions, please, you can send them to me privately. Faida Badamosi, you can send them to me privately. So, um, Samuel, thank you for answering that. And I hope we, we picked one or two things from what Samuel has just said. So I don't know if Olajide and Otega want to contribute to that within 30 seconds. Um, I think I'll just go in like, 30 seconds. So um, what Simon said is right. However, studying your course outline can be overwhelming before you get in. Because I remember studying mine and I probably didn't do half the things in UI because I came directly from my BSc. So that can be overwhelming. So even though I knew the courses I would take, I knew I had little or no background in them. So my advice is um, don't let that um, scare you. It's very important because once you have fear, then you don't move beyond that. So don't let that scare you. Even though you get there and you realize I'm not assimilating as much as I think I should, just calm down, breathe, and tell yourself you can do this. It doesn't matter if you study, because for the United States, some people have like the start the, the entrance exams in quote. So if even if you take that and you find out you didn't do well, and even though you study, don't let that weigh you down. Because usually for some schools, it's usually a first step. It's not the determining factor whether you get kicked out immediately. So you can actually, you have a second chance to prove yourself at your final exams. So even though you study the course, you start reading research papers and you find it overwhelming, take a step back. It's very important. Don't, you're not on a race. You came there on your own. So put in your best and hope that your best is good enough to take you through. No, oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So, um, Olajide, I don't know if you want to add something to it. Okay, thank you, um, Faida. Basically, um, the other two panelists have said it all, but um, I will just just briefly share what I, I did. I, in my class, when I arrived at my in my class, I discovered that I had local students. When I say local students, the French students who are studying, and we just joined them up in the program. So they came in for the previous year. So what I did then was to get close to them and ask them, hey guys, how do you do things in the French system? Do I need to go abroad? Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? So I got those tips from them and I was able to strengthen. Because there are a lot of course materials, like you said, and like Otega said, there's a lot of course materials. You don't want to overwhelm yourself. So you want to ask them, how do these guys do these things and, and stuff like that? So that was, that was um, those things I did and I think that they were helpful. And also, um, you want to just briefly want to understand the cost point because, yeah, for example, in France, um, it's not all about taking the materials in your head and everything. Uh, I discovered that um, they do things practical. They bring um, questions from the industry, so you want to really understand what you are doing. And you want to be able to express it in case you are meet these things in your courses or your examinations. I think with that, basically, just connect with people that are there and know how things are, are working out. And then okay, okay. Thank you so much. Um, still with you, Olajide. Um, considering you you went to a French speaking country for the first time, how did you handle the language barrier? Okay. Um. Thank you. I hope you can hear me clearly, right? Yes. Yes. Well, basically, that's where uh, preparation comes in. Uh, 
you already know you are going to um, a country where you don't have, you can't speak language. So you really need to prepare well. And so for me, I, I knew I was going to France. I knew I would have something to do with um, the French language for a long time, a long time. So I attended a um, basic um, French language course in Lagos. So uh, I spent, a, I think, a month and a half or two. So I took the basics of French language. And um, I was able to start off with that, you know, communicate with people. And I also um, lived in a, in a shared apartment where I had other French um, speaking language colleagues. So we are in the kitchen, we are cooking, he's speaking, I'm picking one or two words, I'm improving, I'm going to my classes, French classes, I'm picking things like that. I went to internships, um, I relate with people uh, when we go for car to canteens and talk, and I was able to pick not the educational French language, French speaking language used on the street. That's what you need to communicate with people, not uh, the structure. But first, you need to start with the structure, the basics of the language, and then you continue for there speaking on the street. So I knew I was going there. I knew I was going to teach French for a long time, so I could get well ahead of time before coming. So I advise anyone, whether you're going to France, whether you're going to Germany, you know ahead of time. One year, two years, go to Lagos, use our friend language apps, go to Lagos, I think classes, then pick it up from there when you get to Europe. Oh, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. So it's a thing of just you being proactive. Thank you very much for that. Um, so there's this particular question, actually. I know there is no language barrier in US, UK, since they all speak English. But you know, one of us is still worried that what if the foreign lecturers, they speak very fast. So Otega, how did you, did you ever have to be doing all this? And eh, eh, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Okay, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I try to answer to the best of my ability because uh, for my case, I, I would be very honest. I've been always able to grab the foreign accent. It was pretty easy for me to transition. So I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that question. However, um, if you find that not just for your lecturers, actually, you will be teaching foreign students. If you have a graduate assistantship, you will be a TA. And from very naughty ones, you'll probably say, oh, I can't hear her, is her accent. You will probably get that too in your evaluation. So I think that right at, at this point, don't, don't be bothered about your accent. Be confident in how you speak. It's very important because what you can do is just, Nigerians speak slowly. So nobody can complain that they don't hear you. If they do that, they're just asking for trouble. So be confident, don't be guilty. Speak as you would ordinarily speak. And if it's for listening to your lecturers, just come early to class and sit in front. Come early to class, don't, don't tag along with the bad guys and sit at the back of the lecture. Some lecture halls are usually really huge. So, but if you're in grad school, it's probably a small lecture hall. So sit in front, listen. And if you don't understand, raise your hand and confidently say, sir, can you repeat yourself? No one's gonna kill you for it. That's the cool thing about being in America. Nobody will kill you for it. So be confident, number one. Just don't let anybody, if they say, oh, you have an accent. Uh, yeah, I'm Nigerian. Yes, I should have an accent. Everyone has an accent. Even Americans have different accents, right? Southern accents, Northern accents. So you want to be comfortable in your own skin and be sure to raise your hand and ask questions if you don't understand in class. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. And oh, yeah. can, can I have a... Okay. Can I add something quick, please? Okay, sir. Okay, sir. <laughs> yeah, just 30 seconds. I think Otega really said the right thing. But one quick thing that I wanted to ask, because I know many of you guys will be graduate assistants and teaching assistants, you'll be asked to teach. In my case, I started teaching the third year I got to the U.S. You can imagine from Lagos to in front of the kids. So one of the things, like you said, they're going to ask you, I can't hear you, you have an accent. But if you happen to be in that situation, grab your chalk and a duster and everything you said they don't hear, just write it on the board. Like in case in America, they call water, water, water. That's one of the issues. I was a geology graduate teaching assistant. Every time I say, I'll say water, they say, Femi, huh? huh? <laughs> At the point in time, I have to start writing on the board. So that would surely help you to navigate. And I tell you before you know it, within weeks, months, You'll be in their shoes, you'll be calling water, water too. So, <laughs> again, you'll be fine, but 
you're going to get that chalk and uh, be prepared and don't be intimidated. Be, 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 be proud of your accent. Teach yeah. them your language. Yeah. Tell them things. Be proud of where you come from. I mean, right. that's very, very Thank important. You. Thank, Thank you very you. much for that, sir. Yeah, yeah. If I can quickly ship in, I think, the, I think the, the biggest asset for you is your confidence. Because once you lose that, you are just going to be in trouble throughout, oh. the, especially if you are teaching. So don't ever lose your confidence. They would try to treat, even there are professors that are white, they try to, they try to embarrass them sometimes. So, so don't ever be embarrassed. If they hit you, you can hit back. Sometimes it's allowed. So <laughs> okay, but well, let's just be careful. But anyways, really, confidence is important. Um, so Othega, I'm still I'm still with you because you know it is very exciting and inspiring to see that you completed your studies just in May and then you transitioned to I don't know if it's a Fortune 100, 50, or 500 company, Intel. So um, I've had, there's so many questions that are targeted towards how do you position yourself right from first year for a job after grad school? How do you tailor your research to an industry standard, like to help you get an industry standard job? So I don't know, could you, could you shed some light on this, please? Uh, sure. Um, without running a risk of sounding too spiritual, the first answer is God. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, I, I think that I, surprisingly, I got into grad school thinking I'd come out uh, an assistant professor in some college, actually. I wasn't, um, at the very beginning, I, I didn't really think I'd end up in industry immediately, um, but over, over time, things change. However, to answer your question really specifically, in my first year, I don't think I was thinking jobs. I was just thinking survival. <laughs> I was just thinking survival, really. Um, at that point, I wanted to find my feet, which is very important. Because if you are Nigerians who say, um, if you become that proverbial chicken that has two feet on the ground, then you know how to navigate the waters from there. For your PhD, you have time. You have um, four, four to five years to do that. So basically, in my um, position, I looked, research for me was very important because when you go out there for your interviews, you will be presenting your research. And then the power to tailor this research into what they're looking for is also a skill. So for me in chemistry, basically it's basic science, right? To do small scale research and stuff. So over the years, I learned, even though the hard way, but I learned to be able to tailor my research towards a particular topic. And what really helped was as I progressed, my, my boss let me go on conferences because they want to see that you are able to put out your research out there in a very likable manner such that they can relate to it. Because most of the time when you go on on-site interview, they have no idea what you're talking about. You're the expert in the room. So the, the power behind um, being there is you're bringing your research to these people that probably are doing something absolutely different from what you're doing. So my strategy basically was find my feet in uh, my academics approach like get a research that I thought would be suitable if I decided to go to academics or the industry and that's why finding your advisor is key right you want to look through your research pour through your research and see what do they do is this helpful to me in the future and for me I found that out and then as you go on don't be quiet like if your advisor is someone that doesn't talk about conferences be bold enough to ask him or her and say is it okay, do you send to conferences? Do I need to apply for certain funding to get funded to go to conferences? Because you need that in your CV, right? And then writing is very important. For me, coming from BSE, I, I had no publications. So learning how to write um, scientifically for, for the sciences and um, learning how to put that together in a presentation is key. So it was a very important skill I learned. So when it was time, my conferences actually exposed me and then people saw me. And then through networking, I got the interviews, which was basically by God's grace, my job seeking was very painless. And I got that. And then from the onsite interviews, I got my job in February and I defended in May and started oh. immediately. So you even so, got your job before you completed yes. the program? Wow. Yes, I did. Which is why I said first factor is God. 
and then the effort and hard work you put into it. So yes, you want to be able to have the two major skills, writing and presenting, and above all, able to tailor your research to what um, to whatever company or place you're presenting to. So finding your feet is very important because that kind of basically um, helps you um, with every other thing around. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for that detailed response. Um, so participants, if you have any question as we move on, please feel free to send me your questions privately in the chat box by Ilat Badamosi. Yes. So um, one question here says, coming from an educational system with weak experimental background, you know, Nigeria, oh my goodness, how do I cope with the use of advanced laboratory equipment? Uh, so like the, um, the, everyone just said, first of all, you don't want to be afraid. Don't be afraid. I mean, people keep telling you, oh, it's a $50 million equipment. Yeah, but people use it, right? Like, don't, don't let that scare you off. So for the first time, so for my experience, when I got into the lab, I was like, oh, there's so many things I didn't know how to use. Nigeria has no XRD. Nigeria has, well, we have people in the bar now in Ibadan, I believe. But then when I was there, there was no such thing as that. However, start from what you know to what you don't know. It's very important. We had like the FTIR in the bottom, I remember. So seeing that made me comfortable. I was like, huh, at least I know how to use the IR. And then I progressed from there. So don't be afraid to read off manuals. YouTube is your friend, whether you <laughs> like it or not. It's amazing the content you can find on YouTube that you probably can't see in the manuals. And if you, also the library is your friend. These libraries are stuck with like up-to-date books go through the internet, pour through YouTube, how to use this, how to use that. And stand, don't be afraid to shadow. Like if you're doing something and you find your senior colleague doing something, can I watch you? Just say, uh, well, I'll be really fast. If you're trying to, it's just fine, I just want to watch. And as the human brain is structured, the more you watch, the better you get at trying to navigate through the instruments. So first of all, don't be afraid. Human beings have used it before you and people will continue to invent more. So don't be afraid, pour through the internet, YouTube, get how to use it, look through the manuals, read research papers where people have applied this knowledge. Yeah, just some research papers basically on XRD, how to use what it has come about. So find those things and read them. So it, it's the sacrifices you make in your spare time, be able to read this and don't be afraid to shadow anyone, shadow them and learn how to use it. Great, great insight, thank you for that. Um, Samuel, I, I think since you, you're still in the system, you know, there's a question here that says, as a first year PhD student, what do I focus on making a perfect GPA or developing my research skills? <laughs> That's a very excellent question, but I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that both of them actually work hand in hand, um, especially if you're in the United States, um, where, for instance, in my program, you have to do coursework and you also have to do lab rotations. Um, you, you, can't, you can't give one more strength than the other. Even though I have had recruiters say they don't pay attention to the CGPA when recruiting, but some do. So you won't really give one weight over the other, but I would say do one thing at a time. When it is time for you to face your academics, do it squarely. When you are in the laboratory, do the laboratory. When it's time for you to learn a skill, learn it as if that's the only skill you're learning at that point. Because the truth is the myriad of um, techniques that are being used down here overseas are really, really very overwhelming. Before you finish learning one skill, you're already learning another. So it is important that you actually pick it one at a time. Let me add just this one tiny bit to what the previous speaker said. I remember being interviewed by my first laboratory rotation supervisor. And she asked me, So she asked me and she said, she said, do you have any molecular experience? I said, no. She said, have you run the, said, have you run the PCR before? I said, no. She said, have you done the gel electrophoresis before? I said, no. 
He said, then what, what did you do during your master's? I said, well, I know all the theories, but I have never handled any of this equipment. And she was like, okay, thank you for being honest. Welcome to my lab. Let's see how far you can progress. But the truth is within the short time, learning one thing at a time. You can't learn all the equipment in one day. So also you can't learn all the techniques in one day. As your coursework is going, give it all your attention. As your research, when it is time for your research, you can't learn everything in your first year. You can't learn everything in your second year. It is a journey. And you will keep learning until you leave. So I would say you don't pay too much attention to research than the academic, because at a certain point in time, you'll be done with coursework. And the only thing that will be in your life will be the laboratory till you graduate. OK, thank you very much for adding that. Um, Olajide, you actually studied in two countries, if I'm right. Oh, am I right? Yes, you're right. OK, so the two countries, you know, you had to go to one first, then you went to the other. What was like the most impactful cultural shock you had <laughs> in these countries? Okay, yeah, thank you. Don't share the Yes, I can hear you. Please, everyone, please kindly mute your mic. Okay, great. Um, if I could think of one impactful experience. Okay. I need to first state that uh, when I arrived in France, I, I had to start learning the way, the French life, obviously. And then when I try, moved to Germany, um, it was uh, it was a shift in uh, moving from the French style of um, interacting, of um, relating with people, into the German style too. It was a, <laughs> it was it was quite difficult. But if I could remember something. Uh, Cultural shock experiences. You need to uh, you need to watch. You need to watch and learn. You need to see uh, how it's done. You need to. Uh, I, I think that was one experience. I, I tried to. Uh, I tried to. I tried to get into a circle of friends, for example. I tried to get into a circle of friends, for example, in Germany. Uh, but I realized that uh, it would be difficult if you don't speak German, for example. We don't speak German, so you want to come in from the aspect of okay, trying to improve your language proficiency skills to, to a particular level, and then you can be able to move into this circle of friends or things like that. So that is one um, cultural experience I, I recite. Although it's not impactful, it's not. I would say it's not so uh, positive, but I learned from the process that uh, if you want to get you into the circle of friends, because Germans can be quite research. If you want to get into that circle of friends, you need to words, you need to um, have some level of um, German and language skills and be able to speak one or two things and then gradually you transition and you relate with people. So, but basically, moving from France to Germany, no doubt it was hard, it was difficult, but um, overall it was a great experience. Awesome. Thank you, Ahmed. You enjoyed France, Germany, you know. <laughs> um, Atega and Samo, I don't know if you could just Tell us the most impactful cultural shock you had when you got to the U.S. Gentlemen, first this time. I'll just think. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, let me go first. Um, for me, actually, being a Yoruba boy that was raised in one village in Ondo State and finally find himself in the United States, I, I am known to always bow my head when I'm greeting elders. I always use the word sir. When I'm sending email, I'll say, good day, sir. I hope you're doing great. Blah, blah, blah. I gather all the good grammar. And funny enough, you just get this email from the professor telling him, you make me feel comfortable, uncomfortable. You, you made me feel uncomfortable by the way you address me with sir. Call me Frank. And I am surprised that the name of my professor is Samia Devani. And she said I should call her Sam. So standing in front of my supervisor, and I say, hi, Sam, <laughs> can I have a word with you? It looks so weird in my head, but that is the culture over there. And I had to quickly adopt 
The second cultural shock was actually walking down the streets and seeing people walking naked. I'm a Yoruba guy, man, and I believe in covering your body. So <laughs> when I see people on this empty clothes, almost naked, I'm like, oh my God, what's wrong with these people? But when I realize it's just their lifestyle, it's the way they live, it's not as if they're bad people dressed that way, but it's just their style of life. I think like, okay, those were my two major shock actually, especially the one that I have to call my supervisors, my professors by their name, without even adding any professor or doctor or whatever, call them by name and they respond easily. It was it was okay. a game changer for me. Okay, and I yeah. guess you know, them by their name most likely made you more comfortable, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Otega, um, sure, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so I I'll just touch quickly on that. Um, the color first name thing is it's very hey, common, yeah. here. like mostly people don't even feel comfortable when you address them, um, with their titles. However, you'd be surprised how much of Nigerians in quote or Africans, they've come to experience. So I would advise that go ahead to say Dr. This or Professor This, and then wait for the invitation to say, oh no, call me this. And then you go ahead to do that because um, people actually know that Nigerians are pretty respectful. So don't jump into calling anyone by their first name because you feel, oh, I heard it, it's cool. No, call them Professor or Doctor and then they say, oh, please call me Nat. And then you say, oh, okay, hi, Nat. But regardless, never let that get into your head such that you start taking them for granted. Very important. Regardless, whether you call them first name or not, make sure that the idea that they're your advisor or your professor, your lecturer is still in your head. Don't let that get in the way. So coming to my cultural shock, I think it was more of how very outspoken I can be. Because if I feel something, if I experience something, if I notice something, I really just say it after thinking it through in my head, of course. I say, uh, I don't think you should do this, but I just realized Americans are not very confrontational people. So um, they don't really exactly say everything. Uh, you might hear it somewhere else or talking about it to somebody else, but they ordinarily will not approach you with what um, they think about certain situations. So in this regard, you want to be very, very observant. Most times just it's, it's, um, it's better to be silent than to speak. And for me, um, I was able to get that knowledge spiritually. I, I'm pretty spiritual, I'm sorry, I can't help it. But you, um, you want to be able to know when to talk and when not to talk. Now when to put your ears to the ground to understand, um, because there are some times that you might have People might have opinions of you that may be necessary in addressing certain issues, but no one's going to tell you because they think oh, maybe it's not cool telling you a bad thing. But however, you want to put your ears to the ground to be able to hear so you can improve on that particular aspect. So for me, that was um, because in Nigeria, you do stuff. People just say, oh, man, yeah it wasn't nice you're not going to get that a lot of that here nobody's going to tell you how bad you are in setting things directly um, to your face so having a friend that can like tell you be frank with you is also a, a good uh, plus so that pretty much was one of the things i didn't know before i came here well the movies didn't tell me that so i didn't know that so, yeah okay okay thank you very much sorry, Okay. Sorry, quickly, I could add something to that. Good point by Samuel. Okay. The thing about um, you. Can, can you hear me? So, it, it's a, yeah, it's a good one. I had a supervisor that we had a 35 year gap. So, it was pretty really difficult calling him doctor or professor. And he tells me, you know what? He said, just call me Francis. Call me G. They call me Francis. I'm like, it's not made that mistake every time. You see? And he told me something, he said, it makes work easier. It makes us move on where we start. We, we, I see you as colleagues, because actually you are going to be my colleague. Imagine you are a PhD researcher or research engineer working with the industry and company, because that's something common in France or Germany. And when you finish your PhD, the same company hires you. So they don't want, it's just like the transfer, they don't want it to go smoothly. You don't need to put the titles and everything, but you really need to recognize where the gap is. You really need to know your supervisor and keep that level of respect. Keep everything professional, but just call it by name. So. Okay, thank you very much for adding that um, because we're really, really running out of time and we've not covered some very important questions. 
Um, you know, we've been talking about academics, academics. Now let's talk about living, you know, finances, the living condition and all of that. So someone, someone had that, how difficult is it to, to get accommodation? Then when you're living in Nigeria, what are the things that you should pack? Should I take a lot of gari? Should I take a lot of indomie and all of that? <laughs> what, what should be my bag? Should I carry a bag that is maybe very, very big, you know? So <laughs> what, what oh. advice do you have for us? Oh, okay, I'll just go quickly on that. Um, I think that when I came, I pretty much just did books and a couple of clothes because I felt clothes could be bought. But books that I needed I, from school, for example, like who pushed me through my first year, I, I took that really important. So I had a book, a bag full of books alone. And wow. then, oh yeah, um, a bag full of books alone because I wanted to take everything, my four, five, two notes, my everything. And they were very useful, still are useful now. So it depends on... I mean, priorities, I guess. So, but books, uh, books you feel like you, like maybe your lecture notes that you think will help you through. You should take that along. So I put a lot of priorities on books. Clothes can be bought, right? And talking about food, depending on where you're going. If you're going to, I mean, food is very important. If you like African food, like Nigerian food, like I do, you want to take food along. Um, but then I think put priorities on like uh, probably books, um, books that you feel that it's just you, you have it. You're not going to see your lecture notes online, right? However, there are some eBooks you can get that you can afford to leave back at home um, for that. So um, yeah, it, it depends really basically on, if you like food, African, your Nigerian food, please by all means, take it alone because it's pretty expensive here, depending on where you are. So uh, yes, so take your food along. If you can afford that, please, by all means, take your food. Um, uh, don't be particular about clothes because I mean, in the US, nobody cares what you wear, really. Um, <laughs> but um, if you want to make an impression on how you dress, please, by all means, go ahead with that. Um, but basically, put priorities on books you feel you will not be able to find here and will help you to find your footing. So, yeah. Okay. So, Ola, did you say more? Ah, well, well for accommodation, um, you should and try to liaise with the international accommodation services in your university. <laughs> Realize that um, you as an international student, uh, you have priority. Um, you see, sometimes you, you may have tried to get accommodation and you don't, you are, you are not able to get it online. You know what, just take your bags straight from the airport, go to the international office, try to arrive when they are open. Drop your bag at the entrance, tell me, I'm all here, my hands up, I don't have anywhere to go. Please find they are going to do something at that particular moment. You see, you have no option. They are going to do something. But, but what I believe is if you send them messages, you get priority as international student. Also, if there are cities that are really difficult, there are some cities in Europe that are difficult to get accommodation. You want to find a Nigerian that is there, for example. Go to LinkedIn, it's pretty useful. Go to Naira Land, that's a very great place as well. There are threads. They are created for, con for certain countries. You want to last with people that are there, oh, out the accommodation thing. Some people might be checked out accommodation, like that. But for food, I, I love food. So I had a bag full of food, <laughs> local food, it's dry all, all stuffs, dry all stuffs and everything. But when I go to my city, I realized that there were African stores and I could get some things. But just to keep you going for the first month before your stipend comes in, you can get some local food and some things that are really pretty expensive. So that is basically what I can say. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that response. You know, this session was planned to actually just be one hour long. So, um, and I'm sure that our participants are actually really gaining a whole lot from this conversation. So I want to plead with our panelists and yes, our participants too, if we could have 30 more minutes. Is, is that fine? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, there are questions that can I combine part time jobs while I'm in school or engage in other manual jobs to help me with finances and my living expenses? Will, it, will I be able to combine that with my studies? How, how would I do that? I, no. I think I see. Okay. No, go ahead. Please. No. Okay. So um, the regulation matters, right? Um, it depends on the source of your funding. So if, if 
you are a TA or a GA or you're a fellow, there are strict regulations of the fact that you are a full-time staff and you are not supposed to have any part-time job attached to it except during your summer. Um, I think there are about a month or two during summer where you have the freedom to have um, outside jobs. That is if you're a TA or a GA because the contract is usually a 10-month contract instead of 12 months. I don't know how it is in other schools, but that's how it is in my school. So if you are given a partial funding, then yes, you can actually um, find other means to raise money. But if you're funding, like mine was a full funding, and me getting a job, either it is part-time or whatever, it's illegal to my status as a student, to my legal status, and if I'm caught, actually I can be deported and I can lose my admission. So it is something you really have to check what kind of funding are you receiving. If it is partial, then you can work. But if it's a full funding, be careful to ask the international office what are the regulations for you to be able to, uh, maybe you can take a part-time job or not, and they will advise you on the best thing you need to do. I think that's my take. Okay, so I, I think that the orientation does a really good job, at least at University of South Carolina. The ISS orientation does a really good job at spelling this out for you as to what you can do and what you cannot do. For a fully funded PhD program, your TA covers the entire time. 12 months, it's, it's, a, it's a rowing thing for University of South Carolina. I don't, it differs from school to school. So you pretty much get your salary every month throughout the year. And especially when you transition from being a TA to an RA. And if you're not extravagant, I think it's pretty much okay, at least for University of South Carolina, for you to live on if you like sense of home, if you're a nice person. <laughs> and also, it, it's pretty much enough. It's not compared, you're going to hear people say, oh, grad students are the most underpaid people because we do a lot of work for less. You will hear that, but don't pay any attention to that. Just focus on using that to meet your living expenses. It will cover your living expenses. It's designed that way to cover your living expenses, your rent, and every other miscellaneous you can have. And you can have extra depending on how much you spend, but it's designed that way. And I don't think you're allowed to have more jobs um, based on you have like the maximum amount of hours per week as a TA or as a research assistant. And talking about fellowships that get you extra money, sometimes in schools, it's actually you can find um, fundings for that. Like you can talk to your advisor and then get extra money. But if the, the not so cool part is most of these monies are for research, not for your personal use, if you get like a fellowship or funding. So it also depends on schools. That's why it's important to listen during orientation to know where you stand, whether or not you're legally allowed to um, get additional jobs. And talking about, if you're not allowed, there's no need risking it. And if you are allowed, say you're in partial funding, please try to draft that in such that your academics and your research do not suffer and your health does not suffer because if you're trying to juggle so many things at the same time, and then the main reason for which you were admitted starts to suffer, then there's a problem. So it's more like a choice of being really prudent with your resources versus having a, a lot of just get so much money to do other stuff. So it, 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 it's important that you listen and try to implement that. Okay, thank you for so, that. So I, I think uh, um, if I can say something real, real quick, I think we, we also need to be realistic here because when people leave Nigeria, automatically there is these expectations that you are, you are going to automatically become a millionaire as soon as you land in the US. So you have to set that expectations with your relatives. When I speak to newly arrived uh, graduate students, you are not coming here to become a millionaire. You are coming here as A students and the amount of money that, 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 are, that, that are going to be paid to you are meant to take care of you. So you have to you have to let your relatives back home know that I'm not, um, I'm not yet uh, capable of sending you dollars now. I will get to that point down the road, but now I need to focus on my education because the truth is, if you get caught working outside in the amount of hours allocated to you, you're going to lose that funding and you might even lose your admission and you're going to go back to square one. So you need to set expectations to your relatives back home and let them know that um, give me four years, give me five years till I graduate. 
thank you very much. But you know, we will definitely take care of you. Yes, Let me sir. just add one sentence before the, okay. the on this very very important. One sentence, like you said. <laughs> yeah, please, guys. If you have a, if you don't have a scholarship or funding, like Miss Ortega said, you can work on campus. But mind you, that money cannot even take you through paying your tuition. You are talking about five dollars, seven dollars an hour for twenty hours a week. That is not that is not enough. So again, if you have a funding there is no way you can actually take extra job because you are putting 20 hours into that funding and the rest 20 hours out of the 40 hours is going to be to your education. So again, if you have funding, there is actually no way you can have extra job on campus. But if you don't have funding, there are ways or there are some schools whereby you can work on campus. However, those funding is hardly enough to pay for your rent, please. So like Femi did said, you need to make provision and tell your friends back home that you are a student, not millennials. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that, sir. Um, so we'll move on quickly. This question is quite personal and you know it's very, very important for all of us. Um, someone, um, and a lot of people are asking, how did you, was there ever a time maybe you were depressed? or well, well, not necessarily depressed, but maybe almost. And then how did you handle loneliness? You know, a lot of us, like me now, I'm going to miss my siblings a whole lot. I don't know how I'm going to handle that. <laughs> I, I think that's why I had the fact of sanctuary there as like the very last factor when I stood, um, when I did my three minutes talk. It's a very important factor I am a daddy mommy girl. So I literally cried like a baby when I left Nigeria. So it's, it's um, very important that you factor in how to establish your contacts. For example, I call my parents practically every day and my siblings as well. So when I made my timetable of how to exist in grad school, I factored in when I could talk to my parents, regardless of how busy I am. So for me, it was my, my strength, like what would keep me smiling and throughout the day. So look at your schedule, see how you can touch. For some people, it's the weekends, it's Saturdays and Sundays. However, you have to, I guess, mentally tell yourself that you will not be seeing these people physically for a while. Thank God for technology, video calls, and all that kind of stuff. So what I did was just factoring the calls into my timetable, factoring the time difference. And it was like, um, even though we're not physically there, but they were there for me all the time. And so that kind of helped me um, cope with that and it's okay to use the word depressed because when you do experiments 10 times and they don't work you can be depressed so um for that you want to um first of all in addition to just making sure that you you don't get discouraged and you keep pressing on trying alternative ways talking to people to to solve that um just make a time to talk to people that you care about and you love because it really helps. It goes a long way to boosting um, your, your psychological strength such that you are able to um, take care of all the things that you need to. So factor it into your timetable um, and um, talk to them as much as you can to help you um, with your work or with your study. Like to say. Thank you. Um, Samuel Olajide, do you want to say anything? Well, um... If I could say something, uh, I could remember during the corona um, uh, pandemic situation, I was stuck in France. I was, um, you know, we are, we, are, we are in a strict um, lockdown for two and a half months. So I was in my room uh, working from home. And you could imagine how difficult it is that you want to go out. You only have to take um, an attestation to show the police and things like that. But I was quite lucky that I stayed in a shared apartment where I had other French people. So you want to try to ensure that you are staying alone. You want to have um, people around, even if maybe your apartment or uh, your apartment composition, you want to choose it carefully. You might have your space, quite right, but you want to be seeing people and don't want to get into that depression box. Quite right, you can also, uh, like we are doing something, we are discussing on the, uh, on the show today. You can get involved in things like this. You can volunteer in things, you can mentor young ones, you can speak to them. You understand? You factor all these things into your timetable. And you just want to be, you want to, you want to ensure that you, you speak to people in the process and you don't want to be alone. 
also if your experiments are not working find something that uh, your getaway route it could be um it could be a sports club it could be a maybe you go to the gym it could be a football club or something like that you just want to find something that you, you used to get away for me sometimes if things doesn't work i just pick my bag take and flix boost is a bus service within europe i go to the next country and i do have some fun and then i come back and things work again so that's what i do just find something that helps you get away from the Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Samuel, are you still there? I'm here. Okay, okay, yes. Okay, so um, another question is, when you get to grad school, you know, we already have, how do you build your research interest, especially for someone transitioning from BSc to PhD? You know, the kind of BSc research that you do, that we do here in Nigeria. Some, in some, well, let me just stop there. Well, <laughs> how, do you, <laughs> how, how do you actually pick the, what research you're going to be doing, what research you're going to focus on? Oh, okay, I'll just stop basically because I transitioned from a BSc to a PhD. Um, I, I'd say I was in luck because I had Professor Woods and he was pretty intense when it came to research. Actually, one of the people that actually developed my, uh, my research interest. Um, but when I got here, I actually had, um, I thought I was going to do something I did back in UI, um, but I didn't see anything. So what I did basically, again, I am spiritual that I am, I pray. And then I, I basically looked through all the professor's research to see which one just like came out to me. And for me, I was interested in um, new materials, uh, materials that have not really been studied, which is how I chose my research advisor. So it really depends on like, go through all the research lists and try to see um, which one kind of calls out to you. And if nothing does, you can actually always talk to people around about their research because you can tell from the way they speak about their research, the excitement in their eyes, how interested they are. You also want to look at like what would be involved in that research. If it's, um, for example, computational chemistry, how well do you like coding? Do you like it? Well, I didn't in my grad school. So I stayed away from physical chemistry or computational chemistry. And I focused on inorganic and organics because I knew I loved synthesis and that, that kind of um, area. So it also depends on what area you think you love and you think you, think you can thrive and the backgrounds you will need for that particular research, which is what formed my decision, regardless of whether or not I had the background in that research. Okay, great. Okay, I think I, I, would, I would like to ask um, So it, it all depends on the program also that you are admitted into. Um, for my program, it was an umbrella program. And what an umbrella program really means, um, in my case, was that. It was just this one program that consists of about six or seven departments. So usually all your first year courses cut across all these seven departments. So you're not really, I came in as a microbiologist and I only had a one lecture on microbiology all through my fundamentals of molecular biosciences, which lasted for about three months. So what I'm trying to say is the exposure to the different materials and the challenges that are ongoing in the field, which was the first step, transitioned me into my second step, which is lab rotation, where I have the opportunity to rotate in three different laboratories, which I have developed interest in after my rotation, after my fundamentals. And I can extend this rotation to five labs in case I don't find a choice in the first three labs. And after that, I have the right to start my thesis, and if I don't find the lab interesting, I can still switch. So one thing I can just tell anybody coming to the US is, this place have a lot of flexibility. Don't be overwhelmed. The flexibility is really there. When you come here and you start up research in the lab and you don't find the work interesting, you can transition into another lab. It all depends on what you want. So finding out what you want, I think, it's going to be an elephant project if you think you can figure it out from home because when you get here, you might find something more interesting than what you really think you are doing. I had it in mind that when I'm going to come here, I'm going to be a virologist. Well, when I came here and I saw what the virology curriculum and the content is all about, I was like, no way I'm doing this, you know? 
So you can find yourself in a shoe like me to just be open-minded. And when you come here, I'm very sure you will have a lot of options and you'll definitely find them. Uh, very quickly, if I hear that, about that, um, before you think about transitioning, be sure of the kind of program you are in. It's very important because uh, for schools, some schools um, don't have like this really vast program. And um, sometimes when you get into a lab and you want to leave the lab, sometimes the professor is not very happy. So you want to make sure you cover all those basics before you like hop from one place to another. It's very important. So, so I think you also have to check the kind of funding you have. If your funding is mobile, uh, you can transition and, uh, subject to what uh, Ortega just said. If your funding is not mobile, that is if your funding is attached to the research that your professor is doing, there is no way you are gonna transition to another program or another department or another laboratory for that matter, except you are, you are able to find another professor another professor or professors willing to take to take you up so you have to be very careful uh, when you make your decision i think my wife uh, my wife um, uh, is a virologist by the way uh, somewhere um uh, is a is a perfect example of this she was in the lab and our professor was extremely mean so the the the, the good thing about that was we we spoke out and um uh, we were able to find out that our funding was mobile. So we, we, we were able to leave that laboratory and, uh, and, and go to another lab. So, so you have to be careful about that. Okay, great. Thank you so um, much. Sorry, Faida. Yes, Alashide. Uh, just one, one quick thing. I, I know something about US that, um, um, especially programs that are interdisciplinary that you, want, you can really move um, between labs. You do rotation with your first year. It depends on your program. But if you are coming directly from Nigeria and you are fixed to a person who takes you directly to a lab, like you said, you can't do nothing about it. So you want to be sure before taking up the offer. But if you are in that interdisciplinary program, even at your first year lab rotation, when you are moving into the lab, even though you like that research, think about the social aspect of the lab. How is your professor's behavior and everything? Even though you like that research, if your professor is, let me use the word shitty, if he's not a good professor in terms of relation, please run. Try and have another option. And and move into another second option. Yeah, also, there are, so I see some things that some programs, some students want to go into a lab because they are funding, but uh, the social aspect of the lab, the relationship is not good. And because of um, that's the only option they have uh, because of the funding, please don't take it up if you are in that situation. If you have to rotate, go into a lab, or it's going to give you a tough time getting through and even to affect your mental health, you want to check another option. I've seen students who even move to another school entirely because um, they don't want to um, relate with this type of professors based on um, um, feedback they'll be getting from upper year graduate students. Imagine someone in the upper year telling you, my professor is this and that, and that's the only option you have to get from me. Please look for another um, research area that you can switch to and you go in. If not, you can still make transfer in school. That's what I know, and I'm speaking this from um, an experience I know recently. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so, so much for that. Yeah, so how do you build your professional network while in grad school, you know, many of us that would leave now, we're all just going to be focused on having A's, doing our research well, you know, our social life, our professional network and all. <laughs> we're not even going to look at it. So how do, you, how do you think we can strike a balance and also build the professional network? Okay, uh, maybe, maybe I need to go on this. I'll talk from the European aspect. Um, for you to build all those contact and professional network, if you are if you are a master student, for example, you need to go for internships. You need to um, look out for um, opportunity to take internships. It might be six months, three months in your program. That is where you get those contacts because the references are important for your next um, internship or your next job. But if you are going into a PhD program, for example, in Europe. There are some PhD that are industrial um, related. So if you want to really um, expand um, your network, you want to target those type of PhD. Those are the places you go for um, company um, meetings or conferences. And this is where you pick um, up um, contact or things like that. But if that is not your situation as well, um, um, conferences are good places where you can pick up. Um, you want to know those that are going there. You want to know. Um, those that are coming, you want you know what they do, 
and I'm mind them there. You want to meet up with them at the conference after your presentation. You want to relate with them. Oh, I, I love what you guys are doing in group and like that. I think that's the way most people um, get their, their uh, expand their okay. professional network and basically transition into the job. Okay, um, great. We have just less than five minutes, and I would still want us to take just two, three questions. Um, someone asked, like, how did you guys handle racism? What is it like? Oh, I, I guess I, I can go first. Um, it is here. Just have that at the back of your mind. Um, it, it's a very important reality to, to understand. And once you understand that, you'll be at peace. Now, like I said at the very beginning, confidence is key. I had um, people judge you just by the color of my skin thinking, oh, you don't know anything. Um, but I overcame, right? So you want to be confident and you know you're, you're smart, you're here because you are capable of doing that. Regardless of whether it be in the mall, in the shopping mall, or in the market, or in school, whether you hear it subtly or uh, just blatant that way. The first thing you want to do is don't react, at least not immediately. It's, it's, it usually doesn't solve anything. You might be angry, but just take a deep breath and think to yourself, you're not all these things um, the person is um, calling you out to be. And I have a, a, a really cool saying that says that your attitude and your, um, your behavior speaks louder than what you'd ever say. So um, the, the more you do um, uh, really good in your academics, nobody is going to come to you third, in your third year and, and think, oh, you're black, so you don't know anything. I mean, your academics and your performance has spoken for itself, that you actually know what you're doing and why you're here. So I would say, first of all, find peace in the fact that if you probably encounter it one way or the other, and, and your immediate response shouldn't be that of anger or... So if it's getting really bad, then definitely you can talk to somebody about it, especially the ISS office. You definitely can talk to, especially if there's somebody persisting, hounding you, hounding you about that, you can. But very first things, usually don't just, silence usually helps because then the person realizes just how stupid or silly the comment was. And um, then you can just move on. But above all, your behavior, your performance will speak volumes more than what can ever say out of your mouth really. And there are times that you really need to correct people's notion. Those times you will almost know when to speak and how to put it in a really nice way such that the person sees that you're not coming at them with anger. You're respectfully and politely telling them you're wrong. It's a terrible stereotype and you should change it. So that, that was my approach. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that, Tega. Um, Olajide, considering you were in two countries and then you were in Europe, what is racism like there? Or what was racism? Yeah, you're still there. What is racism like there? <laughs> yeah, ob obviously there is um, in every aspect of life, you know, in supermarket and everything. But uh, I love the points. Um, so that I won't take much time. I love the points uh, Otega gave. You really know when to speak. I really know when to call some people and to educate them about that because uh, they can be blatantly ignorant at times about you, about where you are coming from. So you want to, um, there are some people you uh, lecture and they understand. And there are some people who you react, especially when it is a repetitive process. And there are some situations whereby your performance totally, I mean, the way you act. And when you also integrate into their society, people, um, that's what I noticed. You integrate in terms of speaking, and they are able to communicate with you at times. Um, they start changing their notion about you. At the time, they look, they see you as a French, they see you as a German, especially if you take them uh, some time um, in the community as well. So basically, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Um, please, if there is any question that we've not covered during this conversation and you still want me to ask, please kindly send it to me in the chat box. We have just a few minutes left, but you can still send your question. So, um, Oluwa Tobi, um, sorry to actually mention the, the name. He wants you to elucidate on the possibility of doing a concurrent master's for those of us coming from a PhD program. For those of us, I believe, going to a PhD program from a BSc background, does it affect our funding? 
I don't know if you got the question. Let me try mm. to go over it again. Not clear. Not clear. Okay, it said, kindly help elucidate on the possibility of doing a concurrent master's for those of us going for a PhD program directly from a BSc. Mm. Maybe he's saying BSc to PhD, we're doing a master's in between, like an MSc PhD joint program. I don't know. But, um, okay, you don't. Yeah, I think I get what he's trying to say, but you don't need that. Um, so if the, the, the thing behind the BSc going directly to a PhD is most schools will ask you, so what's the highest degree you wish to attain? And if you say a PhD, and if your credentials or your your profile meets that, you get that you admitted for a PhD. Now, if you really want a master's by the on the way, you can get that. So after your second year, you can actually speak to your advisor and say, oh, can I get a master's on paper? and then just continue with my PhD. And you guys can work something else. You can write the thesis for that and you can get all the necessary credentials. They give you a master's and then you just move on with your PhD. And then if you're thinking of like stopping at a, a master's with that mastering out, I think that's what we call it, from that advisor and moving on to a PhD with another advisor, it's also possible, even within the same school. And then if you want to move on to another school, that's also possible. But if you're saying that you you, you think you need a master's, you necessarily don't because it's okay to have a BSc and have a PhD next. So it's not like you have to get a master's for you to be relevant, but if you really want a master's, you can definitely talk to your advisor about it and get the master's on the way. Okay, great, thank you. I think there's a classic clarification that needs to be made there. Sorry to cut you off. If mm -hmm. you apply for a PhD program, you are going to go through that PhD. If they, and that means there are schools that will award you a master's degree at the end of your two years but what you are accepted for is a five-year four-year program phd program and you have to go through it maintaining at least a 3.0 gpa so i think that's what he's probably referring to and at that point in time the funding covers the whole five-year program for instance Yale will accept you for a phd program but after your two years they're going to award you an m field which is like master's degrees most schools will do that, Stanford and all the rest. So, but if you are accepted for a PhD program, your tuition, your, your financial, whatever, covers everything to the PhD. But at the end of two years, you are awarded a master's degree. So you don't need to be worried about financial. Okay, thank you very much for that, sir. So we'll not be taking any more questions now. And there is someone, there is a participant who actually wants to just give us some insight into cultural shock that, I don't know if it's a Mr. or a Mrs. or a Miss Shay Femi. Um, no, it was me. I, I think, yeah, it was me. It I'm was using, you. Yes, oh, yeah. okay. okay, it's your daughter. Yeah, let like, me just yeah. use one minute. Um, I won't really talk about that. I just want to appreciate all our panelists. They've said so much and I really thank you all. One thing that I just wanted, I think is very important for our first year that I think has been mentioned, but I just want to emphasize more on it is the networking and the co uh, extracurricular activities. That is very, very important because I know for me and a lot of people that I've mentored in the past, coming from Nigeria to a new environment like this, some of us are bound to be like introverts. You know all these things, you don't want to share with your colleague, you don't want to share your own work, you don't want to discuss. I would advise that is not really the way to go, especially in the first year. Try to mingle around, especially if you are in the US. If you notice, most of the graduate department are filled with the Chinese, the Indians. These guys are very, very smart. We are smart too, but you'll be surprised that most of the things you are struggling with, they know the answer. They can do it for you. They can walk you through it in minutes. So if they ask you how to go play soccer, my brother and sister, join them. If they ask join you them. to go take a drink, Go there with them, Go there, drink, yeah. get a bottle of Coke or, or Sprite, mingle with them. And not only that, at the end of your career, when you leave that school, most of those guys will be in a job position that they will give you a call, hey, there is an opening here, you want to work with us. So guys, that is very, that will help you a, a very, a, in, a, in a great deal in your first year. Don't hold yourself to, don't hold to yourself, don't, I mean, share your experience, share your assignment, ask questions, just like everyone has expressed. Again, thank you. Uh, that's just thank something. Thank you very much for that, sir. So, um, I'll, 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 
Um, Faida, so, please. Faida, yeah. sorry, sorry to cut you short. I'm surprised that no one asked the question about um the um, the concept of an uh, imposter um, syndrome in graduate school. Okay. No one asked about that. Maybe no one. No okay. One actually. <laughs> wow. So that's you really, uh, um, tell us a bit about how to just just, 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 just shortly um yes imposter syndrome but the way to get out of it is confidence basically. Uh, we really need to understand that um, science is humbling. Um, there are really a lot of things that you don't know. You are a neophyte in the field, and it is um, you really need to understand that um, uh, you are just growing. There are a lot of things that you don't know. You ask questions, and even when you ask the questions, it may you shouldn't think about you looking stupid. No, if you think about uh, if you uh, the, the capability in you to want to understand the response to that question on that concept, uh, we we push you forward. I can remember one one thing. This imposter syndrome is the same thing happened in my, in my first year. We will be in class. Um, we keep taking courses. No one asks questions. So I'm always like, what, what's going on? I don't understand this concept, so I keep to myself. So at the point, I said, you know what? I can't do this anymore. And I raised my hands that day, and I asked that question from that professor. Do you believe all my colleagues were in the same position? They never understood. So I thought they, they understood. So we all go home dumb. So I, I thought they knew it. But Obviously, we didn't know anything. So, but I was scared at that point, like, should I ask questions? Would I look dumb or things like that? And that was the breakthrough we had in class. So, all different lecturer comes and then we keep bombarding. I was like, it seems I just opened that door. So, we are in the same route, in the same position, and you guys keep quiet. Wow. So, you should really need to understand that it's, it's, it's normal that you don't know something and you ask, and the willingness to want to quickly learn uh, will get you going and be confident about it. So, uh, that imposter syndrome, trying to say, oh, you know this, and you know that. No, 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 no. Please, let's um, try and get off it. Be confident. Try to learn, and I believe I'm... Uh, okay, that was Thank you Thank very you. much for um, saying something about that, Olajide. So um, yeah. we're coming to the end of the session. Um, thank you very much, our panelists. I don't know if you have some passing words, some motivating words for we young birds going into the system soon. Uh Oh, do I need to go first? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I just say, like I said on my slide, be equipped um, to deal with um, the storms because don't kid yourself, there will be storms. Just, and this is why I think you have this platform, which is really cool, where you can network with people. And above all, if you believe in God, definitely that's, that's, a, that's a key point for you. Um, so there will be, um, it won't be a bed of roses, there will be funds. However, the fact that you have um, resources to deal with it, um, it, it, it's a plus for you. Uh, so don't be afraid. Confidence is key. Don't be afraid. Be fearless about your approach to learn, which is why you're there in the first place, to learn. Great. Thank you very much for that, Taylor. Uh, okay. I think, I think I'll go next. Um, if I'll wrap up my experience so far in one single sentence, I would say you should always believe in yourself. And um, drop the fact, drop so many gains say you've had about grad school because your own experience is going to be very unique to you. Um, if someone is failing out of grad school, it doesn't mean you're going to fail. You have your own unique experience. And finally, um, be ready to accept criticism because they're going to come. A professor criticizing your research openly during your presentation does not necessarily mean the professor hates you. It is a method of trying to make you better. So it's a different thing when it happens in Nigeria. I would say, oh my God, that wicked lecturer. He doesn't want me to graduate. No, it's not like that down here. Be open to receive the criticism. Everything is structured to shape you into becoming a better scientist. And by the time you're done, you'll be glad you did. Yeah, well, basically for me, um, I would say um, you shouldn't dwell on um, your past milestones. Um, the first class you are coming from, bachelor's degree in university. You know, um, grad school, science in general, we humble you. It humbles everybody. You should know your professors and everything. It's just that you are new in the field and you still have a long way to go. Also, um, you should um, understand your responsibilities as a graduate student. You have a lot of resources. It's, um, it's your duty to um, take advantage of everything and succeed in graduate school. 
And when you don't understand something, please sorosuke. Speak up sorosuke if you don't understand something. And also, please, that is what I do. Maybe because of the nature of Europe, I take a break from work. I travel around. I get involved in other things just to uh, take my mind off and stress of research and everything. Problem, problem, no, they finish you, if you understand. Problem, no, they finish. <laughs> Try and always take a break. Your mental health is really important. You could imagine that um, you in graduate school and the situation that happened recently in Nigeria, uh, it took a toll on me. So you could imagine if you are in that situation as well, please take a break and get involved in other things. Problem, no, they finish you. Um, good luck, everyone. Thank you so much, Olajide. Thank you so much, Tega. Thank you, Samo. I say we really, really appreciate your presence here. And I'm sure every participant here actually gained a lot from the conversations that we had. Thank you very, very much. So I'd want the president of iScholar Initiative to just give us a closing remark in one, two minutes. Wow, 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 wow. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I... I truly, truly want to <coughs> thank all our panelists, uh, Olajide, Ortega, and Samuel. You guys have been very awesome. This has been a very, very productive, very insightful. Uh, even when I graduated many years ago, I tell you, it's like I'm reliving the life again. So um, thank you. We can just say thank you because Hello? your time, the weight of experience. Hello? Hello? <laughs> uh, sorry. Hello. <laughs> the quality of your uh, of your experiences in diverse ways, um, I think uh, it will make a lot of impact on our aspiring graduate students, even those that are already here or in any part of the world. Uh, I mean, personally, I've learned a lot. I have my pen and uh, notepad here. So again, I want to say thank you guys. And this is the whole essence of um, High Scholar Initiative as our VP um, Public Relation, uh, Joy, had highlighted at the beginning of this uh, uh, webinar. All we do is to make people better and to live a dream that they hold so uh, dear. And everyone is working for free. I mean, this is completely voluntary. And for you to have also you know, um, sacrificed quality time in sharing experiences today that we don't take for granted. Thank you so much. And I must also thank my VP, uh, external relation Joy, uh, with our awesome team, uh, Fahida, Testa, and all of them. You guys, you've done really, really well. And I can also cite some of my management team members here. We have the secretary. Femi Fagyolu, we have uh, Dr. Akambi, who is our VP uh, Talent and Development. And of course, we have our Treasury Minister, Finance Minister, <laughs> Mr. Shiyagai. So thank you for the support, I inspired. And uh, just before I drop the mic, um, I just want to talk to our attendees. Um, this is, uh, you know, you can, you, you could have gone through a 10 year program in the university, yet you, there are things in life that you don't get to see in the books. You don't get to see in the textbook. You don't get to even be told by a professor just because they are real life experiences. You know, um, more than likely every class will be so structured with specific curriculum, but in an environment like this, it's we are real life experiences are shared. I mean, like I said, personally, I've learned a lot. Uh, the word I have so frequently here today is confidence. Yes, uh, either the potential for you to overcome uh, cultural shock and, or even to be able to hold your own in a class setting in, in front of, you know, your confidence is very important and I'm really, really, you know, glad that that was so much highlighted in the course of this webinar. And uh, there is a marginal line between respect and confidence as well. And I think Ortega 
truly did justice to that. I mean, yeah, he, 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 when it comes to, you know, how you address your professors, at the same time, maintaining the, a level of professionalism, yes. Uh, somewhere is not like the way we did it in Nigeria. I completely agree with that. I mean, as a person, I call everybody cipher at Atifa, you or Futa. When I call Professor Rahman, I don't just say Professor Rahman, I put Professor Rahman, sir, you know? But when you go to an environment like this, that is so important. So, and of course, at the same time, they are still your professors, they are still your lecturers. So, sincerely, uh, our attendees, uh, I, I believe, just like I personally feel about this, this has been a very, very uh, great session. And uh, just for you to know, uh, again, this is High Scholar Initiative, and it is fully funded by volunteers. We have the most amazing human beings on it, you know, supporting us in one way or the other. And everyone is welcome on board. There, are, there is always a space for you. There are things you can do. So um, the more the merrier, and more importantly, the more the broader the impact until the last person wins. So we must not rest. And uh, there is so much for each and every one of us to do. Once again, I want to say thank you and thank you. And uh, we look forward to more of this. And I believe uh, Joy and team are packing you more for the future. So stay tuned. We, I think um, by that uh, truly highlighted how you can contact us. We, are, um, we have presence on social media. We have a website and we have different ways you can contact us. So don't be a stranger. And I can see a lot of our scholars online, uh, both the 2020 and 2019. So it's good, you guys, you know exactly what you are getting by being part of the family. And encouraging your friends, I mean, encourage your friends and colleagues to be part of this. Once again, thank you all. <clears throat> thank you very much, sir. Thank you so, so much. Um, I already put a link in the chat box. It's a feedback form link. It would be very nice to hear your feedback and to let us know what you, what you think about this session. What do you think the next topic should be in our next session?